Ever since CGI permeated mainstream media, there seems to be a cinematic tendency towards spectacular visuals in film that, at least to me, kind of eclipses other aspects of filmmaking altogether. Now, I haven't seen this film yet, but I've read and heard plenty about Tenet's god-awful sound mixing to know where to aim. The last few years have been flooded with VFX-heavy battle sequences and CGI-intensive visuals. And don't get me wrong, I don't mind them, it's just them. Um, it seems to me that with all this excess, we've somehow forgotten about how to tell a good story along the way. As if mainstream franchise filmmaking has become insincere and disingenuous. So yes, this may seem pedantic, but I want to go back to the basics. I want to take a look at a classic anti-blockbuster and see how it's narrated through filmmaking fundamentals. So in this video, I want to talk about Robert Bresson's 1956 picture, A Man Escaped. A visually austere film, A Man Escaped takes place almost exclusively inside of a prison. Spoiler alert, the main storyline follows Fontaine's efforts to escape the compound without alerting anyone. He has to plan everything out, from sharpening spoons to dismantling doors, mostly inside of his cell. And so the question arises, how does Bresson achieve tension when most of the action is confined to such a small space? For me, even though the camera work is fantastic, I think what surprised me most about this film was its creative use of sound. You see, throughout A Man Escaped, sound plays an integral part in telling Fontaine's story. He spends long amounts of time either trying not to make a sound or listening for sounds other people make, whether they be allies or enemies. Take a look and a listen at this shot, for example. This scene happens really early on, and to be honest, if it weren't for the obvious close-up of the key, you might just quickly forget it. But this same sound comes into play later on, while Fontaine is working on his escape. He hears the key rattle against the stairwell, and without showing us this explicitly, we know the prison guard is on his way, so Fontaine stays silent. It's a clever way of using Chekhov's gun in such a way that isn't either visual or story-driven. Another great example of constrained storytelling happens right near the end. So again, mega spoiler alert in three seconds. Ready? Fontaine and his now new companion, Jost, have escaped their cell and now need to traverse a gap between two huge walls by crawling across a rope. After all their hard work to get to this point, it seems a relatively easy task, but the only thing impeding their escape is a German soldier patrolling the grounds on his bicycle. Fontaine and Jost have to listen for the fascist on his bike to time their escape. And while we can't physically see him, we can kind of estimate his whereabouts. Now this happens a few times throughout the film. We are placed on the same playing field as Fontaine, able to hear but not to see, the night forcing us into this kind of silence in order to make sense of the whole situation. In an earlier example, we know Fontaine has to incapacitate a prison guard so he and Jost can advance, but the only way to do this is to get close to him, and so he hides behind the wall, waiting for him to come closer. Il était là, tout proche, à un mètre de moi. Il faisait demi-tour.
Because of where the camera is positioned, we can't know for sure where the guard actually is. In fact, the killing takes place off screen, making us tense up even further until we finally see the outcome. It's in these moments of near silence that a good amount of storytelling and tension is made. Silence is not a relief, but a threat. And in prison, silence is all too common. Now, it must have been right about now in the editing process where I kind of realized the connection between this scene and the train covering up the murder in The Godfather. You know, that scene. Spoilers. <laughs> To wrap things up, I want to speak of silence. You see, in this film, the fascists to imprison Fontaine try to monopolize speech. They try to silence every single prisoner, whether by ordering to shut their mouths verbally or by physically silencing them with a bullet for, like, forever. I believe that by placing the story in jail, Bresson brilliantly creates a parallel between the microcosmos of a prison and the oppression of a totalitarian occupation. As George Orwell says in his article Fascism and Democracy, the peculiarity of the totalitarian state is that though it controls thought, it doesn't fix it. It sets up unquestionable dogmas because it needs absolute obedience from its subjects. And so Bresson places all these different characters from various walks of life together in a prison controlled by fascists to symbolize this. They ask the prisoners for silence day after day, and through it they believe they can control them. Although unbeknownst to them, it's in this very silence that Fontaine plans his escape. It's through sound, or rather the absence of its excess, that the story is told. Thanks again for watching this video. I'm glad you liked my last look at Taste of Cherry, and I hope you'll find this one at least as half as interesting as that one. Cheers, and like this video and subscribe, you know, 